Fantastic. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, tonight, we're joined by Matt Hancock, the Conservative MP for, for West Suffolk, formerly the Minister for Health and Social Care. Um, Matt was elected in 2010, part of the intake that saw David Cameron launched into Downing Street with 100, approximately 100 new, new MPs. Um, and before joining uh, Parliament, before joining politics, uh, Matt worked as part of his family business, his family software company, and as an economist at the, the Bank of England. Um, how are you doing tonight? Hi, it's great to be with you. Uh, thanks very much for that uh, for that intro, and thanks for the invitation. I'm a massive supporter of uh, of the Open University, uh, always have been, and it's a pleasure to be with you. I'll admit now, my intros I think always sound a little bit terse and begrudging when I don't mean them to at all. I tend to not trust myself with all the facts, and I worry that I'll say something wrong. So I, I confine myself to only the three or four facts that I can recall at any one any one given time. Right. <laughs> so, um, are you happy to speak for a little bit, and then I've got a few questions. Would that be okay? Yeah, well, let's. Uh, why not? Why don't we do that? I mean, um, I uh, it, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to spending most of our time answering questions, and I know they've been um, pre-submitted. I'm sure that if you put them in the in the chat as well, then Jonathan will pick some of those up, and we can have hopefully a flowing uh, a flowing discussion. One of the reasons that I do chats like this is because I think it's so important for people who are um, who are interested and who are engaged uh, to be involved and get involved in public service. And whether that's in formal politics in the way that I did, or whether that's in um, the, the civil service, public life in many other ways, um, I think it's really important. Um, my background, I grew up in Chester. Um, I'm dyslexic. Uh, I, uh, I I went to I got to Oxford University based essentially on my maths and there found out that I was um, dyslexic. I got the support that I needed at university to um, be able to um, uh, function effectively and get a good job, uh, as you say, first with my family business and then with the Bank of England. And when I was at the Bank of England, I realized that all the big decisions are made rightly in Westminster by our elected representatives. That's the nature of uh, democracy. And it's it's a good thing. And so I was, I mean, I was sort of a, a liberal conservative bent, but I'm not, I wasn't really political. You know, I didn't do all the politics stuff at university that some people do. Um, and um, I was approached by this unknown guy um, who, uh, who I'd met once at a drinks party. Um, called George Osborne, and he'd just been made shadow chancellor at the age of 33. And he said, um, you, you teach me economics and I'll teach you politics. And, and, um, uh, and that, was, that was, you know, Tony Blair was in his ascendancy and Gordon Brown was chancellor. It was before the crash. Um, and, and so I moved over to work on, you know, the Conservative economic platform where they just lost the 2005 election and were you know, 25 points behind in trust on the economy. Um, and we had a blank canvas. And then David Cameron became the party leader. And, you know, as a sort of forward looking, um, open, um, uh, compassionate conservatism, that he, what he was doing to the party really resonated with me. And I was thrown into the heart of that uh, project to really, um, uh, modernise Britain and with my a combination of my Bank of England background and my tech background um, that, uh, that I threw myself at it but I also realised doing that work behind the scenes that what I really wanted to do was uh, run myself so as you say I ran in, in 2010 and, um, and, and um, you know did, thoroughly enjoyed being the backbench MP for two years but it, but, and then entered ministerial life and the funny thing about ministerial life is that uh, you end up uh, going, you know, you, you, you do the job that the prime minister asks you to do. I used my background um, in many areas and then eventually ended up um, as culture secretary responsible for digital and data policy, which was my background. Thoroughly enjoyed that job. Absolutely fantastic. The, the advantage of looking after the, all the museums and art galleries in the evening. Um, and the day job was spent on, you know, my specialist subject. And then Th Theresa May asked me to become health secretary. Um, ironically, when Boris Johnson resigned from her government, 
um, and um, Jeremy Hunt, then Health Secretary, was made Foreign Secretary. Uh, and she asked me to do that, to try to modernise the NHS and bring in technology. And I, I did that for 18 months before the pandemic struck. And then I suppose, you know, became best known for being the, uh, you know, at the podium all the way through the, uh, through the pandemic. And the rest is history. So the, the, um, there you go, that's my, that's my potted history. But the, the thing I take away from it, and lots of people say, how do you get involved? Is the single most important thing to do is to throw yourself at these things. Uh, politics is done by the people who turn up, and um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, and that's the that that's the starting point uh, for anybody. I have quite a number of friends I must say who work in politics and work in Parliament, both in the Scottish Parliament and in the UK Parliament as well. And um, they're often extolling its virtues to me and saying it's a, a great career path, but I'm probably not for turning just yet, certainly. And anyway, um, you, you can decide for yourself if this puts you in good company or not. But the last MP who joined us um, for these sessions was uh, was Jeremy Corbyn. Um, and okay. He, yeah. Uh, and he was elected in 1983. And as I said, you yourself were elected in 2010. Um, I'm just wondering if you can think about some of the differences there. So when he told his story about his campaign journey and how he became the local MP for for uh, Islington North, um, you know, it, it was it was set in the context of the 1980s. And I'm wondering what it might have been like in 2010. Well, it was it was the Conservative Party at that point was amidst a great rejuvenation, and there was a real sense of a project to drag the Conservative Party into the 21st century, um, to not just be comfortable with modern Britain, to, but to love modern Britain. Um, and Conservatives had for too long given the strong impression that they basically disapproved of modernity. Um, and my view is that Conservatives can never win when they uh, give that impression. I mean, it's just, um, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an instinct within the Conservative movement to understand all the things that have come before. But if you let that dominate what needs to be done for the future, then um, then, then it's not an attractive electoral, electoral prospect. So I, I came, you know, to the I, I came to um, the Conservative Party when it was modernising in a really um, exciting way, um, and there was a real sense of mission, and um, and and that was and an extraordinary group of very very talented people of which I was lucky to be part, and it was a it it, it really was. It, um, this exciting sense that we were going to pick up Britain and really move it forward. And, you know, that first term under a coalition, and a lot of credit has to go to the Lib Dems for um, the, you know, team effort, um, was a very reforming, um, a, a very a modernising pe period in history, and especially compared to what's come since, you know, very successful on... Um, reform in terms of improving educational standards, uh, in terms of modernization of the way government worked, uh, a whole host of areas. Of course, it is mostly remembered for sorting out the finances and the controversy uh, that was necessary to deliver that. And then, of course, Cameron is remembered for the referendum. Um, but that that first parliament, when I went from, you know, I was first elected into it, and then by the end of it, I was attending cabinet, it was a, there was this real sense of, um, of of getting to grips with things that was very exciting. Before you joined the call, I was um, whining about the fact that I have hay fever, and if I sound a bit nasally in my questions, I apologise. Hopefully, they hopefully they come across okay. Um, but you introduced yourself by saying that you, um, when you joined Parliament, you were a kind of liberal conservative, and I'm just wondering if you were, if that sentence were a liberal democrat instead, do you think you would feel the same way? If, if you were on the other side of the coalition, do you think you would still feel the same way about its successes and its merits? And um, would you still be laying claim to that in the way that you just did? Oh, I, I, I hope parts of it, yeah. Um, look at right, gay marriage, one of the votes I'm most proud of in my time in Parliament. You know, that was a proper Liberal Democrat Conservative coalition uh, thing to make happen, you know? Um, there were, there were th there's a whole series of things. Um, most of the Liberal Democrat Party, um, certainly then, was very supportive of the need to get the books in order. Um, and, you know, that period, what is called austerity, people look back without the context of the alternatives available at the time. Um, 
and you know I experienced this to a degree with pe with um, some of the criticisms around the uh, the pandemic and when people say you know oh you um, uh, you know you didn't do the paperwork on the PPE buying well no because we were trying to save lives in the same way in a in a different sense but same thing is that you have to look at the context of the time and uh, you know there was remarkable unanimity amongst the Liberal Democrat Parliamentary Party in support of the measures to to, to basically stop the country going bust. Um, and so I, I hope that, I, uh, it wasn't total unanimity, but it was uh, broad unanimity, but especially on some of the social reforms um, that, that, that I hope that, that Liberal Democrats colleagues who were in government at the time look back fondly on that as well. Another one's education reform, right? Um, David Laws in education as the number two to Michael Gove was incredibly impactful and we and the UK has risen up the international rankings on educational performance, or rather, I may, might say, with a degree of sadness, England has um, since that period. Um, you know, we, in 2010, England was behind Scotland in terms of educational performance and, and now uh, ahead. Um, I don't say that in a competitive sense. I'd say it to, you know, because... Has, they, my, has my accent been noted, has it? <laughs> And uh, but it was a um, uh, but, you know, it was a properly reforming government. Can I ask you just since you touch on it, it wasn't a question I was going to ask you, but just since you touch on it, I mentioned that a lot of my friends are, are active in politics and have political roles and jobs and things of that sort. A lot of them are conservatives. In fact, that that's the, the party that they're they're involved with. Um, and being in Scotland, they they tend to be a little bit more potentially on the liberal end of the of yeah the and their their views. And I sometimes feel a little bit kind of sorry for them. I don't mean that in a bad way at all, but a little bit because I sometimes feel as if they they've put their work into trying to enact a particular vision of Britain that they thought they were you know they thought they were trying to achieve one thing, and it kind of feels like they've achieved something else without necessarily having meant to. Um, do you reckon there's any truth to that? I, I really don't mean it as a particularly pointed or unpleasant comment, but do you reckon there's any truth to that idea? And is there any way? that we can account for that in terms of um, you know, our parliamentary system and the way our politics works? Is that something that there might be some merit to? Well, up to a point, if you look at the MPs who represent Scottish seats in the UK Parliament um, in the Conservative Party, there is the same broad spectrum, uh, you know, from Alistair Jack through to Andrew Bowie. Um, you know, they're both in government and they're both um, uh, but they come from different wings of the Conservative Party. So I think that there is the same breadth that you get. Of, co of course, the Scottish Party is more uh, liberal on the whole. Um, and, you know, I feel very comfortable uh, whenever I'm with it, uh, if you see what I mean. Um, but, uh, but there is still that breadth and all parties are coalitions, uh, right? Um, all parties are... Uh, an amalgam that hangs together uh, rather than a unified view uh, and in a democratic system that's a good thing that's good to me um and there's a q a function so if anyone wants to put some in the q a i'll happily start pulling from that but there was one that i, I personally did want to ask you and it's that um law students are educated quite robustly in my view on parliament parliamentary procedures and you know to some extent how parliament works but quite a bit less so on government and and the way that government works um, as well and the pandemic to me seems like you know the, a great case study moment for where government had to really swing into action and really had to take action and there wasn't that room for for parliamentary action in, in quite the same the same way um yeah. what is some of the sort of machinery of government that you have access to in that moment what are the levers that you can pull and you know what are your reflections on the distinction between government in the context of something like the pandemic and and parliament instead wow well that's a, uh, a huge question yeah, yeah, right. so that, that, that I, got that wider and wider the longer i spoke <laughs> it, it's interesting that the covid inquiry is going into that question in quite a lot of detail even though it doesn't take the headlines if you read some of the um submissions that have been made to it they're very powerful uh in in in, in that uh, in that discussion which i think is um helpful um you know there is a the the british uh state when it swings into action is a is a powerful thing um it, it, in covid we had to obviously take more action than would be um acceptable in normal times um on on a perfectly reasonable uh, principle that um in my case if you're if you're liberal 
then you should let people be as free as possible subject to not harming others. But unfortunately, in a pandemic, you can harm others unwittingly and unknowingly because of the because of the pathogen. Um, and therefore, there is a justification, a sort of uh, political philosophy justification for further action. In practical terms, the British state is very, very strong in some areas and very thin at the same time. Um, and in normal times, this is a good thing, right? The, the state does not reach a long way into people's lives generally. Um, it doesn't, there aren't, there aren't agents on the ground in vast swathes. Um, it doesn't have a particularly big manpower even. Um, but when it legislates, it can legislate very clearly and very firmly if it chooses to. Um, there was parliamentary scrutiny during COVID um, it just wasn't as robust as we're used to. Um, and it's funny because often um, the interaction with parliament and government, people complain about the noise of politics. But the flip side of the noise of politics is the um, you know, robust debate, debate of a healthy democracy. I, I, I'd actually I'd point to a slightly different um, insight, um, which is that in the in the 13 years that I've been in parliament, um, the 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 point of the limit of the authority of the prime minister has changed according to circumstances. When in coalition, the, both the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives in Parliament were pretty unified, and the limits on the power of the prime minister was effectively whether Nick Clegg would wear it. Right? If Nick Clegg and David Cameron agreed on something, it basically happened. And they had a system called the Quad, where those two, plus Osborne and uh, uh, Ale Danny Alexander um, got together once a week and if Quad agreed to something it basically became law or government, the government position. Um, so the limit of the authority of the Prime Minister was his coalition partner. Then um, under, after the election when Cameron had a majority of 23 I think it was the limit on the authority of the Prime Minister became whether whether a, a, a dozen Tory MPs would object. Uh, and that became, a, so, uh, so the limit became parliament rather than within the government. And then that became even more extreme when Theresa May called the 2017 election and lost her majority, because then the limit on the authority of the prime minister became whether the DUP would go with it. And they were of course outside, not inside government. And then when Boris won the big, you know, 80 seat majority, in 2019, there was no limit on the authority of the prime minister for a while. And by chance, COVID came at that moment. And ultimately, it was his, the resignation of vast swathes of his ministers because of his personal behavior that, is, that brought him down. So, um, so the, the, the reason I described that is because, of course, there's a, there's a really important study into how government operates. But the but government is ultimately about the exercise of power, especially at the senior levels. And the, I think a really interesting way of thinking about it is what is the limits on that power and how it shifts according essentially to a parliamentary arithmetic. So my, my background actually, although I'm here speaking in a uh, to a legal forum, my background is actually biology and chemistry, biochemistry and, and subjects like that. Um, and my PhD that I'm working on at the moment is on uh, the the way in which government utilizes science and how effectively government ministers who okay. often are not scientifically trained can actually digest scientific information and whether there's a kind of obstacle there to um, effective governance, if you like, between uh, two parties that need to work together but don't necessarily speak the same language. Um, and uh, I was just wondering whether or not you think that has any sort of merit, just based on what you just said there about the power of, of government and, the, and the, the checks on the prime minister. Is there something to be said for a difficulty also in just trying to process information? Because politicians have their own specialities. They may not be given the brief that corresponds with that speciality, but they have their own kind of specialised knowledge bases. And it seems to me to be quite a stretch to ask someone who um, whose background is economics and subjects like that who you know it, it rose very highly through the ranks of, of those subjects to suddenly have to start understanding virology and and infectious disease and things like that it's quite a quite a tall order well um there's a there's two ways of answering that question um the first sort of constitutional way is that as the secretary of state or as a minister you're not there as the subject matter specialist you have advisors who do that and your job is actually to represent the public in making a decision in a democratic system. 
so and, and I think that's really important. So as health secretary, I was not the representative of the doctors. I'm the representative of the public. Uh, and I lead the and uh, led the NHS and the social care system. But I am there very much as the elected um, element, ultimately making the decisions along with other elected ministers. So that's a sort of democratic principle. There's a more practical answer, which is, um, yes, of course, you need good scientific understanding. In my case, um, I, I was in areas that I was uh, had background in until I moved to health. But I was one of the reasons to go to health was to bring the tech in. Um, and then when the when the pandemic struck, epidemiology is actually quite similar to economics. It's about the interaction of hard science and social science, because it's about the interaction of human behavior and and uh, and science. So, uh, you know, obviously, Chris Whitty was there as the epidemiologist, but I found it really quite straightforward to transfer my um, the, the my economics background. Other ministers, if I just put it diplomatically, other ministers and other senior folk um, didn't find that quite so uh, natural. Um, and, um, uh, and that is a challenge, but you know, they rely on the first of those. And I used to say to people who would, might criticize uh, Boris for being good with words, but less good with numbers, you know, he's there for a reason and that's because he can communicate. You know, that's why he became prime minister and why he won a, a big majority of the election. So, um, you know, let's, he's got his skill set, and a good team brings lots of skill sets to bear. Moving swiftly along. <laughs> so talking a little bit about the NHS, uh, I'm going to pull a question from the Q&A now. Um, what were your visions in regards to the modernization of the NHS? Yeah. Uh, and how do you feel technology would help to achieve this? Well, this is really important. Um, because tomorrow is the 75th anniversary of the NHS. So people are naturally asking questions about the next 75 years. And my very, very strong view is that the NHS free at the point of use is uh, incredibly important and a vital national institution, but that it can't survive, frankly, in this model without a combination of two things. Firstly, helping people to stay healthy in the first place, which the NHS is, frankly not very good at it spends far too much resource on patching people up and not enough on helping people to stay healthy second technology not not just for the you know really high-end cutting-edge treatments which actually the NHS is pretty good at it's technology to be well organized right when I go when I have a GP appointment I want to be able to click on a uh, on a on a chart on the web on their website to decide when it is rather than get a letter through the post um you know the fax machine is the uh, emblem of this although there's now supposed to be only a few dozen I mean, why there's even a dozen i don't know but um it, the use of technology and data to organize the nhs is very poor compared to almost any other organization of its comparable size and you know yes more money please and uh, yes to the uh, good plans that were published last week to recruit more, uh, but alone those things are not enough because the budget going to the NHS cannot rise faster than GDP forever um, because um, otherwise we'll all end up, you know, there'll be nothing else. So there is naturally an end point, must be an end point to that. Um, uh, that, that is just a statement of sort of reality. Um, the um, and therefore it's about the question of how you use resources as efficiently as possible is 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 key and in the modern age data and good use of information is um, and it's this isn't even cutting edge AI I mean yes of course use that but it's basic organizational efficiency using data well I may have skipped along quite gleefully from the, the Boris Johnson uh, comment, but I can certainly agree with you on that. I had a, a minor operation about two years ago, and I kept a little stack of all the letters that I was sent of yeah. you know, trivial, a meeting with a consultant and uh, some rescheduling took place. I mean, I had a wedge of letters about that thick. And I, I was thinking, how is this possibly the way that we still do this? I mean, shouldn't there be, I mean, at the very least, they have my email address, they have my phone number. You know, how is this still the way that we're doing this? This massive wedge of mail that I received for, and I'm just one patient among many, many others. So, um, yeah, I, I definitely agree with you. There's there's some um, comparatively old technologies that probably 
could be made use of in, in, in that way. A lot of the questions centre on, on your time as, as a minister. And I'm just wondering, how does one become a minister? So you're elected to parliament and you, yeah. you, become, you become the new MP, the, the new face amongst quite a few others in your case. Um, yeah. how, how does that happen? So you told us that you, you, know, you were introduced to George Osborne and he was able to sort of slightly bring you into the world of politics. Once you clear that big hurdle of becoming an MP, how do you find yourself as a government minister? Well, that is entirely down to the prime minister's discretion. Uh, so you're supportive of the prime minister. That's the number one thing. Um, the um, in practice, the uh, the whips, the infamous whips, um, advise him on who of the juniors you know looks promising. And ultimately, it's about making a name for yourself in a in a relatively small way within Parliament. It's not really about being on the national stage at that point to, to get it to to be asked to serve in junior ministerial office um in my case one of the things i did because i represent newmarket is i made myself the voice of horse racing right so you need to have something about you something to say and i uh, campaigned to get uh, the law changed um to make sure that offshore betting was properly regulated um uh, uh, in the way that onshore betting is and that became my campaign you know, and, and it, I became known for that and also then for going out on the TV when asked to defend the, the government. Um, and ultimately, you know, you, you play your part as a junior member of the team. Uh, you try to uh, make sensible interventions. You know, it's always a tricky balance between oleaginous support for the government of the day and saying things that are interesting and edgy and you've got to find a you know, a, a way through the two of those. You don't want to be a complete mouthpiece, but at the same time, you don't want to criticise uh, the government and certainly not the prime minister. So, you know, that's 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 politics. I must say that that's the thing I always say when when friends of mine say politics might be an avenue for me. Um, I'm not very good at pretending I think something if I don't, and I think that might be a challenge. Is I don't know if I'd be very good at holding the party line in that way. And in a sense, it's almost kind of kind of sad to hear a senior politician say that's a prerequisite you know that you have to um you have to on key issues kind of pretend that you share a view that potentially you potentially you oh don't. no i think that's uh, that's not that's not how it works in practice because if you disagree with the government strongly on an issue then you just and you want to be loyal you just stay silent so it's totally reasonable to say i won't go and support you on that uh, but you're just quiet about it so there's quite a lot of um swallowing things that you aren't enthusiastic about um, then if you disagree strongly there is another route which is that either a you don't try to become a minister under that administration and you go all out attacking the government um, and many people have made political careers made their mark um, by being rude about one administration and then being uh, enthusiastically lapped up by the next um, or um, to do so in a way that is smart, right? Running a campaign analogous um, or orthogonal to where the government is heading um, can be a very effective way of making your mark um, and um, uh, 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 and showing that you've got what it takes. You know, look at Steve Baker, right? He's a minister in the Northern Ireland office, was a minister under Brexit. I don't, you know, you may or may not agree with him. Um, but he certainly made his mark by making life difficult for the government and then being they, they decided he was better inside the tent, so to speak. And uh, that's a you know, that's a completely different uh, way of doing the job. Duly noted. Um, how does being a minister differ from being an MP on a sort of day to day basis? I appreciate you do both simultaneously, but you know, is, it a, is it a very I imagine it is a very substantial reform of your daily agenda and. Um, and a, a really significant change to your your role. Yes, it's a completely different way of um, of being, um, and it's a um, um, it, it, it's it, it's different on two levels. The first is the um, degree of scrutiny. You know, as an MP, you are doing the scrutinising, and you're not you're accountable to your constituents, but you're not accountable in Parliament for really for what you're doing you're doing that you're asking the questions the ministers are accountable to parliament for what they're doing i mean your day-to-day -day life is is very different it's very structured as a minister very organized you know every half hour 
um, as a minimum is accounted for and you know you're trying to drive an agenda forward and trying to um, change things for the better as an MP you're trying to change things for the better but you're using the method of communicating and challenging and asking questions um, it's obviously much less powerful a position um, and it's um, uh, but it but it comes with a freedom and more of a um, a freewheeling to be part of the of the national debate. Fantastic, great stuff. Um, someone's asked a question. That I think is quite a nice one actually at this point. So I'm gonna I'm gonna steer towards that. Uh, what's been the highlight of your political career so far? Um, without any hesitation or doubt, um, the um, rollout of the vaccine program. Okay. You know that was an amazing project to be part of, um, and is. Um, uh, you know, we were first in the world, so I'm extremely, uh, I'm extremely proud of that. Um, and um, so I think, I mean, it's, it, it's head and shoulders above everything else in terms of a combination of impact and and success. Could, could I ask you quickly, why do you believe that they were, we were the first in the world? What, what was it about us that, that put us in that position? A uh, combination of things. Um, the um, Firstly, we got started very, very early. From January 2020, we were working on it. Secondly, we'd, we'd, we had the scientific base that was absolutely brilliant. Um, thirdly, a, big, a shout out to the regulator. Regulators don't often get a, uh, a good press, uh, but the, the regulator was absolutely superb. And it took all of the evidence of the trials everywhere in the world. There were four trials across the world, South Africa, Brazil, US, and here. Whereas other regulators, even especially the American regulator, will only take on board trials done in that country. Um, and, um, and then the fourth part was the NHS for delivering the rollout and having a single uh, payer, you know, a, a united system in each, across the country, you know, of course, in each of the four nations, but a, a nationalized system was unbelievably helpful in terms of the, uh, the rollout. Um, and each of these four elements had a different leader who was themselves extremely, uh, extremely capable. Um, and, uh, you know, so Sarah Gilbert and her team on the research, uh, and then Kate Bingham and her team buying the vaccines, June Rain at the MHRA, the regulator, and Emily Lawson at the NHS doing the rollout. Four women, all absolutely uh, superb in the four parts of the, of the vaccine rollout. So. Uh, that's the reason. Trying to find a way to word this question without revealing my own biases. Obviously, I work in science and, I, and I'm, I'm very well across. Uh, I used to work in scientific research as well. Um, a lot of my colleagues when I worked in scientific research were visiting us from Europe. They were they were European students or, or people who had stayed after doing PhDs from Europe and things. And, and they brought an enormous expertise. Do you think that Brexit might hinder some of that infrastructure that you're talking about in terms of preparedness and, and being in a strong position for a situation like this? Oh, in terms of preparedness for the next pandemic or in terms of overall science? I mean, look, in terms of overall science, the, clearly international collaboration is critical. I hope that we get into the Horizon project. There's no reason that we should be um, excluded uh, from that. There's no substantive reason. Um, but ultimately also science is a global thing um, and so we need to make sure that our links are strong both with um, the EU and with the rest of the world. Um, in terms of pandemic preparedness I think that's a, I think um, it's a second order question you know what matters is that we're ready to do what is necessary that we've got the the, the systems ready to scale um, and that we can do the early science on a, on a novel pathogen if it comes um, and then we are ready to scale the response and essentially learn the lessons from, the, from why it was so hard to get going quickly um, last time round. And critically, we must be ready to take the action necessary to suppress the virus, which, um, we, you know, which is a, one of the key lessons um, from the pandemic. They're not Brexit related, really. They're, they're um, the, um, but there is, of course, the the issue on the wider question. And I'm, uh, you know, and I, I, I've I've answered it quite sensitively because you're you're you, know, you declared your bias uh, uh, completely. I, I, I said I would try not to, in fact. But yes, yeah, exactly. I suppose, exactly. I suppose As I you can see from the chat, it's controversial enough 
um, to uh, talk about COVID, let alone talking about COVID and Brexit all in one sentence. Um, it's a, uh, and I'm very grateful for those of you in the chat who are uh, uh, standing up for having a, um, a, a, a sensible and high, and high quality uh, discourse, which is, I think, something that's actually got harder in my time in politics, um, having a, a, a um, having a public debate and discussion that is more uh, that is rational and reasonable is undoubtedly harder than it was ten years ago. And I remember watching the Scottish independence referendum and thinking, "Oh my God, that looks really brutal and ugly." Uh, and then, you know, unfortunately, that 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 wasn't just a Scottish thing. That has now, you know, across the Western world, that has become more of a problem. I must say, actually, I mean, obviously, I, I voted in, in that referendum and I, I obviously live here as well. I actually found that on the ground it was quite good humoured. I mean, I had friends, yeah. that, I had both side, friends on both sides of that debate. It never once caused a raised voice or, or any oh, other really? things. And I mean, I, I, I feel like you get certain segments of the community, probably in any country, who are kind of highly motivated towards being aggressive, regardless of the issue, frankly. And, and this was a great issue for them to seize upon. But actually, it, 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 a lot of people I knew certainly were very convivial about it and and, and understanding. And, uh, you know, they had different views. I, I would say it was almost um, humoured. You know, there was, there was a lot of joking back and forth about respective positions and things like that. That doesn't take away from some of what was seen on TV. But certainly, uh, you know, on a day-to-day -day level, I, I never once felt unsafe for holding a view or or excluded or you know anything like that for holding a particular view um but i appreciate that it was obviously a tense moment in the in the country certainly yeah well that, that's interesting that's is that's good to hear but it did look um uh it did look pretty um some parts of it looked pretty unpleasant but then again sometimes i mean the re you know sometimes that is exaggerated on both social media and normal uh media um it's, uh, I mean, you know, uh, it is a, that is a, that's a feature of it. And, and, but that does, I, you know, that does play back more into debate now than it, than it used to. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I suppose when, when you tackle big questions, you, you ignite big passions, don't you? Um, speaking a little bit then about referenda and about ways of, um, ways of conducting the ballot. This is quite a big question, I'm sorry to say. Um, but someone says that um, politics has evolved a lot over the years with lots of different changes in its, in its practice. And there have been growing calls for systems like proportionate representation um, to come into effect. Um, is this something you have any appetite for? Do you think there's any, um, any merit in moving to a system like that? Well, we did have a referendum on this a decade ago, uh, and it was emphatically rejected. And I think for good reason. Um, you know, the, the, for me, the problem with the referenda is that it makes the voices at the extreme more loud uh, because there isn't a need to try to find common ground. The parliamentary system manages to focus debate essentially on the centre ground because you've got to win a majority for your position. And that means that it's those who are the swing voters, both at, a, at an election and within any uh, vote and um, uh, 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 campaign building within parliament. Um, it's, it's the swing voters that matter. And so parliamentary democracy, whether under PR or under uh, first past the post, does drive the debate to the, to the center, whereas, referenda drive it to the extremes and social media reinforces that view. Um, I think that the difference between having a first past the post and a um, PR system is smaller than the gap between whether or not you basically use referenda. And I think that we've, I, I, you know, I, I think our experience of three referenda in the past uh, decade in the UK has been that we probably shouldn't have them uh, very often. Um, I, you know, that, that, that you're here, here. We're here. Yeah, it's not, not, not smart. You know, let's just say those issues are now put to bed for a generation, and um, uh, and get on with improving the day-to-day -day life of the country. P PR then is something that we we probably do broadly speaking agree on because I, I must say most of the people who are of my age and, and interested in politics seem to me to be in favour of PR, but I, I'm not amongst them. I. I I, I'm never kind of inspired when I look to countries that do have it and you find that the government is composed of five or six different parties, each of whom have, can go into a back room and trade off policies in exchange for forming a government. I feel like the accountability is a bit lacking there, whereas when you have one party that's elected or conceivably two in a coalition, there's a lot of room for the electorate to 
hold the parties to account to say that you had this manifesto when and you know you should be delivering it whereas when it's five or six parties there's the ready excuse of well we had to make compromises and and things like that so I'm, I'm, yeah I'm, and, it, and if people don't like the fact that you have to um you know tow the party line that becomes much worse under pr because the party leadership are in charge of who ends up in parliament they are of course in the in our system to a degree but the local parties are also have a really strong voice in that and frankly you know if somebody um you know if if the if local voters want to get rid of somebody then they can and they do and um so that the the accountability is important there's also the the job of the local mp right i am the mp for west suffolk and i take it extremely seriously and um i represent my people even though i'm not standing again i i you know, I take it extremely seriously. It's not a, it's not an electoral thing. It's a duty, and it's a job that you're, you're, you do until you stand down and somebody else takes that role. Whereas in a PR system, you don't feel that heat of accountability at a local level nearly in the same way. That was a, a point echoed by Jeremy Corbyn too. Although he's broadly speaking in favour of PR, he stressed the the constituency link as being a very valuable thing and not something that he wanted to see to see broken. So, from a system then that you feel probably isn't in need of reform, to maybe some that are. One of the questions from the chat is: uh, Are there any current legal issues that you feel strongly do need reform? Oh, that's a great question. I, I think one that we should look at and address in Parliament, have a vote on, um, is on assisted dying. Um, I think that given that 80% of the public are in support and many countries around the world are looking at, um, and I understand that the Scottish government um, is uh, looking at, because it's a devolved issue, um, this is something that should be addressed. It's a, it's, you know, it's a classic balance of rights legal issue, uh, but it hasn't been properly uh, looked at for many years. Um, and I think it's it's time that that is done, and that uh, and that there's a vote on it. I can't see that happening in the in my time in Parliament before the next election, uh, but I uh, I think it's I think that's really important. Yeah, you know, in a way, as a Liberal Conservative, I'm in favour of, of people having informed choice, and it's one area of life where choice hasn't increased when the choice of you know who we uh, who we marry and um, uh, and, uh, it, uh, and, and so many other areas of our life, ha the choice has improved, right, all, all, all the way down to the very practical, you know, the amount of um, brands available in a supermarket um, the, and TV channels you can watch. You know, choice has exploded in all parts of our life except one of the most important. Can I ask, uh, uh, first of all, I, I like that you said in this parliamentary term, what a, what a remarkable shift in the talking points and agenda that would be if assisted dying suddenly skyrocketed to the top of the of the, the agenda in this parliament. But but I take your point. It's a really serious issue and it's really worthwhile um, discussing it. Is that a candidate for a referendum? Because that seems to me to be a very fundamental reform to you know how we conceptualise death in society. And it, it seems hard to justify that on the basis of a, you know, a particular government believed in it. Is that a candidate for a referendum? Mm -hmm. No, I, I think it'd be an absolute disaster as a referendum because the extremes would become uh, vocal and shrill and it should instead be dealt with very sensitively as a free vote. So it, it isn't, a, one of the reasons it hasn't progressed actually is because it's not regarded as a government thing, as you say, and I agree with that. Um, instead, it's a matter for MPs on their conscience and then individually to explain their position to their uh, constituents. And I think that's right. It's the same approach has kept abortion in the UK essentially out of the partisan political debate. And we, you know, we see in America how uh, unpleasant the debate around that can get if it becomes a, a party political football. So um, I, I basically I agree with the premise of the question, but I think the solution is a, is a free vote on MPs conscience rather than a, a referendum for exactly the reason that we we're talking about that, you know, um, this 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 should be dealt with through um, court, a careful, thoughtful, high-minded debate, um, rather than the uh, uh, the shrill eddies of, of of social media. Funny you say social media. That was the next question I was going to turn to. Yeah. Uh, someone asks, uh, do you think that social media is a detriment to politics and government um, with everyone having an opinion and they're quite happy to voice it via their keyboard, but might not do so in person? Uh, both is the answer. Uh, both. Um, 
Now, I think that there is a problem with anonymity online. Um, free speech is vital because it protects the ability to debate and an individual's integrity to be able to say what they uh, believe um, in a free country. That does not extend to the anonymous um, uh, aggression and abuse that we see online. Um, and the purpose of free speech is not simply to launch um, uh, um, misleading claims and, uh, uh, and unpleasantness. Um, it, it's perfectly reasonable to say what you think. And if what you think is itself misleading, fine, but be held to account uh, and, and able to be challenged uh, on that. So I think there is an element of the um, anonymous online, and notwithstanding the whole Wagner stroke Russian state interference aspect, which is uh, yet another problem with it. Um, the, um, uh, so social media has you know, undoubtedly had the positive and negative impact. You know, democracy is more democratic when everybody can have their voice at the touch of a button. Um, and uh, that was the great dream. You know, I look back 15 years to when Twitter was just getting going and we thought, this is great. Everybody's be, you know, going to be able to have their say. But it turns out that, you know, reasonable people get shouted down and therefore back off. And so you end up with people with much more strongly held views uh, contributing uh, because they don't mind the, 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 the consequences of that. And, and, and then the dynamic of the algorithms intentionally feeding people material that they agree with you know that isn't an accident that isn't a, a you know a side product that is in the design of the algorithms um that leads to some you know this the this bifurcation of debate and then the development of completely bonkers and mad conspiracy theories which uh, can be um can then blow back into the mainstream so um you know there's a, the online safety bill i think is really really important um but you know, learning to live in a world of social media um, is, um, you know, is something that we have to, we have to get used to. You can't, you know, whether or not you want to turn it back, and I don't think I do, um, you couldn't anyway. So there's no point worrying about that. What you've got to worry about is, especially through education and to a lesser extent through the, the rules and norms of society, trying to make sure that there's a proper, a proper high quality reason debate i do worry about that i worry about you know the next generation going into parliament when i leave parliament others coming in you know it is just harder to have a reasonable debate than it used to be Twitter is no use to me i, I type in paragraphs and i get cut off far too early whenever i try, try to <laughs> try to use twitter but i do have twitter and i do sometimes uh, scroll through it a little bit i was scrolling through it the past over the past few days when i've been watching the uh, the inquiry on on BBC, BBC Parliament, yeah. and I'm I'm really interested in the criticisms, and I'm really interested in people's kind of opinions as to to what happened during the pandemic. But I must admit, from from reading through some of these responses that have been kind of produced in response to the inquiry, my feeling is that there's not really much of a coherent line of public opinion. You know, there's there's not a sort of theme that emerges that. that well, you're is, certainly not going to get that on Twitter. I mean, no. honestly. Um, <laughs> So, but, but what I was going to ask you actually is, is that confined to Twitter or do you think that's reflected in the public generally? Do you think that- No, just... it's not reflected in the public. I mean, you know, the, the, I think the inquiry is, going, is as objective a way as possible of asking the really important questions in terms of uh, learning the lessons for next time. My approach to it is personally is to be just completely transparent and, as, uh, and honest uh, and answer the questions. I hope that came across when I was doing it last uh, last week. I take it, I take it very very seriously because I think it is the first stage of saving lives in the next uh, pandemic, and really important. Um, but of course, the reporting of it, and certainly some of the online uh, responses to it, have the exactly the dynamic that you just described and that we talked about, you know, in in the abstract earlier, uh, and it, you know. You can see just a little bit of that going on in the chat in this discussion. So it's a real thing. Um, and, um, you know, my my view is just that it, it, it is that especially now I'm not going to be standing and therefore I'm not seeking votes from anybody. You have just got to be as straightforward as you can be, as pithily as you can be, while still answering questions fulsomely. That's a judgment. It's a balance. 
Um, and, um, you know, people can take it or leave it as far as I'm concerned. I'm just going to um, say it as I saw it with the, and add in my, you know, views with the benefit of hindsight um, and just, just give the best responses I can um, in, um, in the search for knowledge. But, you know, the Enlightenment started in Scotland and it is a, it, you know, maintaining the spirit of enlightenment in politics is significantly harder than it than it was a decade or two ago. I was debating whether I was going to make my next point, but having said that about Scotland, I have to you know I did watch you at the inquiry and I thought you were very thoughtful and lucid. I thought you gave very serious answers to to really difficult questions. I thought you did a great job. Um, in in Thank my you. in my humble assessment, um, there was one I was going to pull out. Sorry, I'll, I'll confess now. I'm not very good at monitoring the questions as they come in. I keep trying to scroll, and I'm not very good at identifying um, which ones I might be worth pulling out. There was one about if I can lay my finger on it, um, access to Parliament. Uh, you know, yeah. are, are there apprenticeship programs? Yeah, there are. There, <laughs> sorry, pardon me. Are there kind of systemic, organised ways in which a person who who might feel that they're from a background that doesn't typically make its way into parliament, um, able to, to gain that access. The person that found the question now says that they're from a, a Gypsy Roma background and they feel like that's very difficult to um, to gain access to parliament from that type of type of background. So they're wondering what advice you might have for someone like that. Yes, so I I, uh, I saw that question. I'm really glad that you've asked it. The, the answer is yes, there are apprenticeships. Um, the I actually introduced them as a minister, so um, close to my heart. Um, and um, you know, I, I, I took on an apprentice, I took on a few, and one of my apprentices uh, from about four or five years ago it, it now works for me full time. She's an amazing, she's my um, primary constituency caseworker. Uh, so it's been a huge success for me. Um, there's also many internships. Um, there, isn't, there is a formal program, but there's a massive, uh, a much bigger uh, in, is people getting in contact with their local MP. Um, or uh, or another MP who they might feel you know an, uh, a political affinity with. Um, so I, I have interns regularly in my office, and whether they're from West Suffolk or I, I'm engaged with the program who put who put me in touch with interns from less privileged backgrounds to make sure you know that people get the chance to um, uh, to see what it's like from the inside. And, you know, I, I'll only take over 18s and I typically uh, do it for a month. Um, but it's something that I'm really, really pleased to be able to do. I'll pull one last one from the chat and then I've got one for you to, to wind this down. I asked this question, to it's, it's a very similar question. I asked this question to Jeremy Corbyn and it had a very slight edge to it when I asked it to Jeremy Corbyn, but probably a little bit less so for you. Um, what about individuals who've studied law and then use law as a way to get into politics? Do, do lawyers tend to make good politicians? Um, there's lots of lawyers in Parliament, not as many as in the American system. Uh, but of course, the job of Parliament is to make laws, so that's uh, that's that's natural and right. Um, I it, you know I, I got into politics to change things through through uh, through you know running the government better, and uh, that's what how I wanted to contribute, and especially through modernising the way the government operates, uh, given my background. And um, uh, the um, but. The law is also, a, you know, it, Parliament couldn't operate without lawyers in it um, with their specialism. And my last one then, I, I put it from the chat also, is that now that you've you've declared that you're not running at the next general election, um, what is it you aspire to do next then? What, is a, what does a post-politics life look like? Well, I haven't fully decided, but I am launching a charity into the early identification of dyslexia because I'm dyslexic. And it was only after I left school when I got to university that that was identified. So that's really important, close to my heart. Um, still in England, only one in five children are identified as dyslexic when they leave school. Universities often do a great job of picking that up, uh, but there's so much more that needs to be done. And I'm very glad the government has recently um, done a publication in which it, it recognises this and, and says it wants to act. And I'm starting a charity to to try to drive that and, uh, and and put that support in place. When lawyers or academics do this guest lecture series, we uh 
we send them a bottle of whiskey or a bottle of champagne by way of by way of thanks. Uh, when it's politicians, we we make a donation to charity. So uh, we made a donation today to a dyslexia charity, and um, because you yes. are coming on tonight, so uh, we made a just a donation um, on that basis because you were joining us tonight. So um, that was our little gift um, to to you. Um, but I've also sent some little negligible things to your office as well, some little pens that we have and, and things like that. Um, I really appreciate your time tonight. It was it was fantastic. And I thought the questions were were amazing. Also, we certainly went around the houses on different topics. We, we managed to cover quite a quite a diverse number, but it, it was really interesting to hear your thoughts and um to hear your hear your insights. And I hope the charity is launched really successfully. And um yeah, and that you what you do next is a is a real success. But um thanks everyone for joining us tonight. And the, the chat box is filling up with thanks as well. And um, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you.